Well, hello everyone. Happy Leap Day. I hope you're all enjoying this bonus day that we've been given this year. Uh, my name is Jane Kelly. I'm the Integrated Marketing Manager with JMIR Publications. Uh, so welcome to our third webinar in coordination with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about accelerating mental health research for transformative breakthroughs. Um, I'll pass things on to the panel soon to introduce themselves and review the agenda and get started with the discussion. Uh, but before I just want to do a couple of housekeeping items. A uh, reminder is that uh, the microphones will be muted. Um, if you do have a question for the panelists, uh, you can type your question into the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. And there will be time uh, for the panelists to answer the questions uh, near the end of the webinar. Uh, we are recording this event. and We will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel uh, for future reference. Uh, so now I'm going to pass things over to Dr. John Torres. Uh, Dr. Torres is the director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. Uh, he is also the uh, editor-in-chief of JMIR Mental Health. So John, over to you. Excellent. Thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar. And we have so much to cover. I'm going to introduce our very special guest, Lee Milligan. He joined MQ, and we'll figure out what MQ stands for in a second. But in 2020, as the CEO, taking over, any of you remember in 2020, we had the first wave of the pandemic or the first part of it. So he took over at a very interesting time. And as you'll see, he's a passionate communicator and collaborating advocates for whole mind, body, brain approaches for mental health and behavioral research. He's worked in the charity sector for over 15 years. We won't talk about his work on ships and boats, but what we're here to talk about that's most exciting is he's overseen multi-million pound fundraising and grant programs for philanthropy and government funding and research in mental health. He's launched surgical evaluation centers in partnership with Harvard University, public fundraising campaigns for the Department of International Development, and done a lot of publishing work with different journals. And what's really relevant to us is he's become one of the central figures in discussions about digital mental health. If you kind of look behind the covers, peek behind journal articles, you'll see that MQ is having this really accelerating voice in different global mental health, digital mental health projects. So Lee, thank you so much for joining us. We have an audience of junior people, senior people, but they all wanna know what does MQ stand for? What are you CEO of? Yeah, that's that is good. <laughs> what, what on earth am I trying to look after? So uh, it comes about from ten years ago or eleven years ago when we were first founded. We were set up by the Wellcome Trust with a seed grant, uh, and the idea at the time was uh, eleven years ago we understood the idea of IQ, so intelligent quotient. Uh, the emerging concept of EQ was being discussed. So, what's our emotional intelligence look like? Uh, but at the time, it was felt we needed to understand more about mental health. So MQ was designed under the, the guise and concept that we need to understand mental health more. And so we would do that through research. Got it. So the, so mental is the M and Q is the quotient. And yes. mental health research is broad, as all of us know. What is it that you, you are currently focusing on and funding? Or let's just talk about your the MQ portfolio that you've overseen? Yeah, so MQ Mental Health Research, as I say, 11 years old. From the very start, uh, some of the earliest papers that came out from MQ were sort of calling for multidisciplinary uh, approaches to mental health. And there was a paper uh, in Nature by Emily Holmes, who was the chair of the Science Council, calling for mental health sciences to become united. So from that kind of early foundation, we were really keen to bring together the unholy trinity of psychiatry, psychology, and neurology, and, and bring in data science, epidemiology, uh, across the whole spectrum. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the hallmark, if you like, of MQ's funding calls. Um, we've had a, a series of different uh, sort of focus calls around um, uh, psychological impact uh, trials, uh, data science um, calls, 
Uh, we're currently running a research impact accelerator, but our kind of flagship investments uh, have been our fellows programs, which are really about investing into early career researchers who've got uh, groundbreaking new ideas and, and really trying to take uh, a healthy risk appetite uh, into what we invest into. So we like to think that we will uh, choose and back the brightest individuals with the ideas that maybe no one else or the traditional funders uh, might get behind. Which is a very important thing in the world of digital health, because a lot of this is certainly new and risky, or traditional funders sometimes can struggle to see it. But I know you guys have, and I think of relevance, a brand new funding call coming out that's on the cusp of, I don't know if it's publicly announced or not, but what can you share with everyone here? Yeah, well, I'm the CEO, I'm allowed to share what I like, but I don't know <laughs> if it's publicly or not, I do actually know, to be honest. Um, so we have a webinar on the 11th of March, which I think is, which we are trailing now, I think, uh, so people can attend that to get a bit more detail. But essentially, um, it's the next iteration of our fellows program. Uh, so looking to fund uh, about $1.5 million uh, into new research projects. Um, the focus of this particular call is for US-based fellows in particular, uh, which is the first time we've kind of limited it from a global perspective to that. To that area. Uh, so grants are in the region of $285,000 per fellow uh, with a really kind of open call and focus um, in terms of uh, the types of research we're looking for. We really want to find the best researchers out there. And we put highlight notices out that will be around children and young people's mental health, suicide treatment and prevention, psychosis, bipolar disorder, ADHD. So really super broad. Um, but, the, but the big focus is how will your work uh, forward and translate into impact for patients down the track. That is, that's an exciting call. And it sounds like a very broad call or any idea that seems like it has clinical translational ability is perhaps eligible. Yes, yes, 100%. So what we've really kind of um, looked to do over the years is we found the more we limit the calls and more we try to focus them in uh, the total number and the, and the quality generally uh, drops quite considerably. So when we're looking to invest this kind of level, um, we want to have as broad a call as possible. Um, but with the key hallmark of, can you can you explain and articulate what that impact will look like? So very often we'll get research applications uh, that sound like great concepts and, and novel ideas, but how they actually make it from uh, bench to bus stop, if you like, uh, is, is the challenge. And that's the bit we're really trying to interrogate. How how capable or willing is an individual to understand and then to do the legwork to, to move that translation. So not everything has to be right at the clinical end of the spectrum, but it does have to show how it can move along a pathway at some point. Yeah. As an aside, I'll just say, I think we've certainly seen it to journal and the society and you've seen it too, is a lot of the digital health research is fantastic, but sometimes it really does struggle to go from the clinical study into, say, an NHS trust or a U.S. hospital or even self-help. And I think as a field, we've been a little bit slow to recognize that engagement is part of the process. It's one step of, of course, it has to work in the study, but it's almost like the price of scalability and everyone has a phone or a smartwatch or a computer is that it then needs to work outside of all those supports. Is that what, if someone's proposing a digital project, hypothetically, is engagement something that you guys are gonna be focusing on or what level of translation are you broadly yeah. thinking about? Yeah, so again, I don't wanna to limit too much. In terms of uh, translation, for us, it's about moving on the next step of the journey, but having a plan for the, the, the forward steps. But, but I agree with you completely, in the digital space particularly, I've met with, quite a number of academics who have got fantastic um see i use i use the term products and academics cringe when i start to refer to their work as a product but fundamentally if it's going to get into the hands of somebody then it's got to either be bought by an nhs trust or or um approved by an insurance company or purchased by an individual in some form or another and and so being able to get your head around the idea that, that that research is actually product development and product testing on the way through and that the evidence base is absolutely essential for the validation of it but then perhaps then skills need to be picked up or partners need to be brought into play to move that product into to actual uses and service and and 
we're not saying that you have to have all the answers to that in an application, um, but it is about showing the recognition of that and understanding of how that journey might need to move forward. That makes sense. Maybe in talking about applications, many people on this call hopefully will want to write an application and then you, sometimes you write them, you put all this love and effort into it, you ship them off and then you go, was that a good application? Was that what MQ wanted? Like what, what are the broad tips where you go like, these are the things I love to see in an application and maybe what are the things you go, oh no, please don't, don't do that. You've probably seen, you've probably seen both. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, uh, we get quite a good quality of applications. So there's not too many horror stories, but I, I would say that the first major thing uh, is the incorporation of people with lived experience is absolutely at the heart of the design of the research. And I think particularly when you're early in your career, um, that's not something you've necessarily experienced or or witnessed or gone through and getting your head around what the value of that looks like can be a challenge. But to put it in context, we surveyed our whole portfolio uh, last year as part of our 10 year impact report. And 96% uh, of the funded projects said that they felt that lived experience had made a tangible and valuable difference to the research they were delivering, those that had it in play. Um, and 90% of all of the surveys said uh, they would include lived experience in all of their future studies based on, based on that. So whether or not it's something you've done before or not, I would say, try to wrap your head around how you can get that lived experience voice at the very center of the design, particularly within a digital context where, you know, UX is at the heart of any good product. So how do you get those, those users involved as early as possible? And if you haven't got them involved in the design at this point, how will we be involved on the way through? So I think that's a, a really key first one. The second one then is, as I've kind of described, how are you demonstrating real world applications? So not that everything we're going to fund is at the, the very far end of the translational spectrum, but we need to understand and believe that you've got a direction of travel and, and that, that and that's plausible. So I think being able to articulate that is really key. Um, a clear dissemination plan. So how will your work move outside of your own lab? Where will it be published? Will it be in open access journals so that it can be uh, replicated? Uh, you know, that's the stuff that we really value. But then how are you also getting out to the wider communities that you're trying to support and engage? And, and the fourth one then, and this is always the trickiest, how do you balance ambition with budget. So how do you how do you absolutely maximize the value of what you're going to spend and, and get there? But how do you not, you know, promise the absolute world on a shoestring where the reviewers on our panel go, that's just, there's no way you can achieve that. That's totally implausible. So I think trying to find that fine balance is, is really important. Yeah. Now when it, it clearly takes what you're explaining takes a diverse team is what you're saying. So this isn't just one academic or researcher write the proposal. What is the successful kind of team, do you think, going to look like who is behind one of these proposals? Yeah, so so at the heart of it, you've got, uh, you know, an individual who's passionate about an idea and, and understands how that can move forward. You've then got, um, you know, excited and enthused and qualified people underneath them who are ready to pick up a lot of the legwork and drive forward some of those outcomes. The The establishment that you're part of is a big deal, not that we're necessarily saying, you know, this university or this institution is better than the other, but there are there are places where you can show that there is support around you from both mentors, but also the wider institution for the work that you're doing. And, and the onus isn't on the, the fellow applicant to do that. It's really on the, the institution to back that up for them. Um, and then as part of the process, we don't just provide money. We also then want to provide uh, mentors for you from other disciplines that are able to support with that and will be brought together as part of a wider sort of fellowship cohort. So it's also showing how your openness to learning and being part of that kind of network um, would enhance. And, and you know, it, it sounds silly, but it's pretty easy to read in, a, in, a, in an application whether somebody genuinely wants to collaborate and have people come together or whether or not it's just them out on their own and, and good luck to the, the rest of the world. I'm getting a sense that cross collaboration is very important to MQ, but again, I think all of you know who publish in our journals too, it makes terrifically better science to read. It sounds like as well as to fun. So it's nice to see synergy in that. And I know you've talked about having the lived experience voice in, in peer involvement is so important. For some people, again, it's, it's not always yet part of the research training that some people have. They haven't been exposed to it. So maybe it's 
background, could you explain why it's so important and how it delivers superior everything, dare I say? <laughs> Yeah, so so you know the field of mental health is is actually a lot further on than some fields have been, and we have colleagues in physical health that, that sort of come to mental health to to plan, try and play catch up sometimes on this. And international development is a field actually that has done this better and better over the years because it was accused for so long of having um, a top down or an empirical approach um, or an empire sorry approach to what it was delivering. So so essentially what we're, we're saying when we say lived experience involvement is. You're trying to solve for a problem for a group of individuals. Is that problem going to get solved better if you include them in trying to come up with a solution or if you don't? Now, if you take a, a totally siloed approach, which is to say, look, these individuals don't have the same skill set or the capacity to look objectively at the process or the scientific rigor to, to work the way through that, then you find yourself in a place where uh, you deliver deliver that research in a silo and, and, and execute against whatever mathematical formula you come up with for the solution. Now that that to some degree might move you along the track, but in reality, we see time and time again that by by not engaging those individuals, there are huge chunks of the story that you're missing out. So, so simple examples are you go off to treat a particular condition and and get on your white charger and think that this is the bit of that condition I'm going to to cure or to solve for, and then you speak to patients down the track when you've got all your research done. Here's how I'm going to cure this particular symptom, and patients go, I don't. I'm not bothered by that symptom. That doesn't matter to me at all. In fact, this is what I need you to solve over here. We've seen that time and time again. And in terms of the application, understanding what are the triggers and the pushes and the pulls that will mean that when somebody starts a treatment, they adhere to it. What are the things that will keep them engaged with it? What alignments do they need to make sure that it's something that's valued to them? Where, where are the levels of stigma that will stop them accessing that treatment? There's a whole host of questions that... In a, in a lab by yourself or on a computer screen, you, you just don't have the answer to. And so the earlier you can involve those individuals, the more likely you are to be able to answer those questions and design something that is genuinely valuable on the way through. Again, if I go back to my kind of make everyone cringe about products type piece, you know, Apple don't sit and design their, well, maybe they do now because they've fallen behind so much, but they don't design their user experience like by themselves on their own. They have to understand the end user. You don't, you don't produce a new drinks product without market testing and engagement. So lived experience and co-production goes beyond just market testing. It's genuinely, how do you have people in your governance structure, on your advisory boards, uh, working alongside you as equals, being remunerated at the right levels for their time uh, to really help guide and direct what you do? Yeah. No, and again, that echoes what we also see in the publishing world of papers, because sometimes we'll see no lived experience expertise. Sometimes we'll see very superficial if they say, well, we showed it to people for 30 seconds. It, but you really can tell the papers that really do a good job or to build the apps or products or VR headsets. It really does shine through in, in a way. And often one of the tangible outputs is just their engagement numbers look better. And again, engagement is not the final metric, but it, it certainly keeps people using it. And again, that often has clinical benefits, especially in the digital mental health world, because the best VR headset that doesn't get used doesn't make anyone better. So it's... No, exactly. And and, and our, our review panels are populated by people with lived experience as part of that review team as well. So they are they are specifically looking at, at that area and whether they think that there feels like there's equitable engagement, whether they feel that the the balance is right. Now, look, there, there are some places where it's a lot harder than others. If you're doing analysis of secondary data, et cetera, like that's really hard to work out, well, how do I get lived experience involvement in that? But there are method, methods and mechanisms you can choose to put in or you can choose to ignore. Yeah. And one thing that we've also seen just in our society work is visualizing and sharing back, say, to digital data. You can do very fancy machine learning analysis. You could do amazing things with chat GPT. But if you're looking for insights in people's data, you have to actually visualize it and share it back with people. And if you tell, it's not impactful if you say, well, there's a very small core, there's a very small p-value or a very large correlation. Actually, it doesn't change care. And it's a very underexplored area of how to meaningfully use the data. 
to say increase emotional self-awareness. There's a lot of steps in it. So even I think the, the data heavy parts do need a lot of, of help. But I guess getting back on lived experience, it sounds like MQ supports people with lived experiences work, not just as kind of demanding it as part of funding calls. It sounds like there's more behind the scenes too. Yeah, so so we host a lived experience network, um, which has about 250 individuals from all over the world, um, covering a whole range of mental health conditions. So people can go to the website and sign up to be part of that. And through that network, then, uh, where there are um, projects that we have funded or researchers that partner with us, we will then recruit individuals into their studies to be part of a lived experience advisory group or advisory board or other sort of models and networks. Um, all of our funding goals are, are co-designed with people with lived experience, uh, our communications, anytime we roll out sort of, you know, a new um, style of communication or commentary on a new subject that's reviewed by people with lived experience. 35% um, uh, of my staff openly uh, talk about their own lived experience, our main writer, our main designer, you know, it's all, it's all integrated and part of who we are as an organization. And, and I'll say one of, even in JMR Mental Health, we have published, we have a special section of people want to share their experience of how technology has advanced their care. Mm. We published one of the most interesting case reports we published is, I'll use the person's name because he disclosed it, it's a paper. The last name is R-O-U-X in JMR Mental Health, but he said, I was having more auditory hallucinations with schizophrenia, and I was told I should go off on a medication that would make the voice is less. And he said, I wanted to see this really work. If I take this medicine, it has side effects or my voice is going to be less. So he basically was using a digital tally counter to count how many voices he had per day. And then using that to plot at different doses of the medication, where there, was there a change? And he built this elegant system that showed for him that the medicine was effective. It'll be different for different people. But in essence, he said, I didn't realize that people would want, be excited about my solution. I thought this was just something for me. And we said, we said, no, we, this is important that you share it. We're going to put this on the internet on PubMed because amazing innovations happen from people who have the experience that they, they know, again, he, he built the solution because he needed it. And I think we're saying the same thing of there's really great partnerships to be made there, but for anyone listening who is working with a patient who has a story or if someone is listening who has lived experience who has a story, we, we do have a section and there's no article processing fees. We can help editing it. We're looking more for interesting uses of technology just to kind of highlight in innovation, but we, we have that as well. So sorry, that was a, a tangent, but no, maybe it reminds me, we are a digital health journal. We're a society, we're a digital health society what excites you the most about technology and mental health? And to, to be balanced, we can say what frightens you the most too, because it's it's not all perfect. No, no, far from it. No. Um, so I think I think there's a few areas where digital and tech type solutions can can really step in. So the first one is in the space of kind of you know precision precision psychiatry. So we're we're in a place now where we can handle and manage more data and more unorganized disorganized, whichever correct framing you want, uh, styles of data than ever before. And, and so, again, to bring the lived experience piece back in, we know as well that there's a shift in the academic world and from patients to move away from diagnostic models and to a symptoms-focused approach to mental health. But that's only going to happen if we're able to target in in those symptoms. If, if you know, tomorrow we scrap the entire diagnosis model, Patients are going to want to know, well, how are you treating these particular symptoms that I've highlighted? And, and the precision element of that is something that I think is coming to the fore more and more. So I think solutions that are looking at that are super exciting. There's a few examples around the world that are doing some really interesting pieces. I think the other space then is, is obviously post-pandemic, we had this you know rush to telehealth medicine and switch to everything online. Um, even stuff like this webinar probably looked entirely different before the pandemic. Yeah. But, but then we've kind of reverted back to normal and back to type, and we've realized that trying to move everything to online on its own isn't going to work. So so where can we see digital 
pick up some of the slack on scalability and accessibility, but go hand in hand with face-to-face -face or other types of, of methodologies. I think that's an interesting piece. The, the third bit then is, where are the brand new technologies that we can leverage into to new treatments? And, and one of the challenges at the minute is the number of truly digital therapeutics that are actually going through trials is, is a lot smaller than people think. There's a, there's a lot of apps being tested and tried, but digital therapeutics is, is quite far behind. In terms, of, in terms of fear, it's maybe not a fear, but men mental health has never done well in the translational pathway as it gets closer and closer to the final final tape, if you like. This is where kind of my plight of where the, where the headline grabbing breakthroughs. And, and within the digital space, I think there's even more things to trip you up on the way through that translational spectrum. So, you know, do, um, do regulators understand what it is you're actually doing? Are they able to actually get help you get through the system? Do, do you need to register a medical device or not, depending on what you're doing? And what does that look like and at what cost? And, and then when we do, what does the trial look like? How do we get through that piece? And even if you get through all of that, and there's a great example here in the UK of, a, of an application that's gone through eight RCTs. It's got through the NICE guidelines, which is our equivalent of the, the FDA essentially. And then it has to get through an economic assessment to prove that it is, you know, to save the NHS money and it achieved that. And it went out to hospitals and went, right, we are ready to roll out, let's go. And clinicians went, no. And they said, what do you mean? No, we've passed every test there is. They said, well, one of your six modules isn't CBT informed and we can only deliver that so we can't. So they're right back to the start. They're already a spin out. They're already ready to go. They've got their cafe done and yet they're blocked by clinicians. And so you've got so many extra hurdles and trip points on the way through. I think there, there's an ecosystem change that needs to keep up and catch up um, if we're going to see some of this stuff come to come to bear. No, that makes sense and What's interesting, I think I'll, I'll paraphrase is there's almost, there's a digital therapeutics approach using the app as a treatment itself, but it's also can the data from precision psychiatry inform what we're doing today. And not that they're, that they're not opposite, but it's almost is, can we augment care today by using the data to make things more efficient or personalized? Or do we have this whole world of these digital solutions and clearly they can work together. There's these fancy words like just-in-time adaptive interventions where the data triggers the thing, but there are a lot of avenues to do it. But I think the clinician training is very important because often the clinicians, just like the lived experience is so important to make sure, but I think we often don't see things designed for use in clinical care and those workflow considerations do seem to eventually catch up as you said, kind of in mental health has not done a great job of always getting that last mile correctly to translate it. And I know it, it's doable though. I think that's the exciting part is everything we're talking about, theoretically it can be fixed or it can be done. We're not saying we have to land a rocket ship on Venus. <laughs> that's a little harder. I think we can do that already. So uh, I need a new analogy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that, that, that analogy might be good yeah. so if you're not careful. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think there is learning from other sectors as well. So so we're in the process of piloting a, a research impact accelerator here at MQ where we've reached out to all of our former awardees to say, look, you've been funded by us now for a number of years. What what would a next steps piece look like and where would that go? And to facilitate that, what we've done is a super light uh, expression of interest call to our awardees to say, look, on, on two pages, tell us where your research is at and what the big next steps might look like. Uh, and then we've we've commissioned um, an impact assessment group to work with a selected five or six to design a theory of change model. So based on where you are today and what impact you're trying to have, what are the resources that you require? What are the steps? Who will the actors and agents be? Let's map that out and put that together. And that's, if you like, uh, to the to the researcher, a pro bono exercise to map that out. But it, it also then helps us to look at our portfolio and say, okay, what levels of investment and by whom would be needed for some of these projects to kick on because you know we're uh, we're not at the scale of NIMH or Welcome or whoever. Um, but we what we do see is that for our fellows, for example, they go on after an MQ fellow to, to secure five x funding in their next application. And so what we're trying to do is how do we move that to ten x and how do we shorten the time for them getting it? Well, let's help them understand what their domain looks like and what that pathway could could be. 
5X is pretty appealing. So maybe we should quickly then review your upcoming funding call again before we move on to questions, because I think that 5X is going to excite everyone. So let's quickly review that part of what is coming up. Yeah, so it's our fellows call um, focused on individuals based in the United States, uh, three to seven years uh, post-grad qualified. Um, and the idea is it's really looking to invest in people to move into independence, to set up uh, the sort of first lab or first major project. Um, the funding is uh, $285,000 per fellowship um, with really super broad openness in terms of what that can be spent on. So apart from um, university core costs, it can pretty much be spent on anything uh, on the way through. So we're hyper flexible in what that looks like. Um, we have a, a webinar coming up on the 11th of March um, where people can meet some of the panelists who are going to be um, reviewing uh, what's being delivered, wow. questions about that. Um, and the call will be open from March to a date in May that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's all the details will be published. Um, and it will go through uh, initial review of an expressive interest, a full review and an interview at the end of that. And we're looking to invest hopefully upwards of $1.5 million in this first call focused wholly on the US. And maybe I'll open up the questions in one minute, but one last question. So clearly, Lee, you've showed us MQ. You've not only told us what the two letters stand for. You've helped us understand there's so much that you guys are doing across across the ecosystem. What would you want people listening to know perhaps how they can support MQ too? We, we've talked about all the things that you're giving out, but perhaps there's a two-way street? Yeah, so so MQ is, uh, is wholly funded through philanthropic income. Uh, so we're leveraging money into the sector that hasn't come from other places. So, you know, we're sitting alongside some of the big um, uh, conventional government-backed uh, funders. And so anywhere in which we can uh, continue to improve the understanding that mental health research has impact, that we can uh, continue to showcase what great lived experience looks like, well, these things are all of interest to philanthropists. And so we're always up for collaborating with researchers. We have a partnerships team uh, that work on specific projects that can uh, either help to manage the experience outputs for individuals that, that aren't aware of that. We have a whole series of sort of webinars and training courses that we can get engaged with. And I think just spreading the word around what MQ is doing and uh, continuing to talk about it is just an exciting way for us to look at what new money can we leverage into the space that hasn't been there for the past number of years. Yeah, no, and it's impressive how much, again, the digital space that you guys are are doing and kind of helping support it. So thank you, Lee, but let's open it up for questions. And our questions can be about MQ, about funding in general, publishing. I think we, we can take a pretty broad approach. And I see one right here. So it says, I'm very interested in suicide prevention part mentioned by Lee earlier. My relevant question is in terms of mental health issues issues, earlier prevention with digital tools like digital phenotypes together with just-in-time early prevention, where are we now in terms of the technology capability to do it? So digital phenotypes, suicide prevention, ready for prime time, ready for grants too early? Yeah, I, th I think that the, the biggest challenge that I can see, I'm not I'm not an expert in, in suicide prevention, but we, we released a paper <laughs> Uh, last year in Lancet uh, called Gone Too Soon, which looked at early mortality because of comorbidity and suicide and what some of the solutions for that looked like. And digital interventions were definitely one of the core outcomes that came there. The, the paper talks about the real challenge being that most people uh, who, um, who have a suicide attempt are not, uh, rec are not, have not been in contact with the clinical system before that point. So, so in the paper, we refer to them as people who are in mental distress rather than having been diagnosed with a mental illness. And so I think anything that is in that early prevention um, element has to understand how it engages people that aren't already in the system and how it, how it can either predict who those individuals are or reach out to those individuals or find them in a way that isn't through a, a front door or front access point, um, as opposed to somebody who's had... Uh, an episode of psychosis and so okay early prevention looks like they've had one and we pick them up and then we treat them before they get to two three four five suicide is a little different so i think anything in that space that's the challenge to try and get there but uh, if there's any way we're going to do it it's probably through 
a digital outreach rather than knocking on every door in the in the city. And I'll comment on the digital phenotypes that again the capturing is real time signal from a smartphone. It's a method that we've seen a lot of early papers on, but if you look carefully, a lot of the times the data collection had a lot of missingness, there was imputation, the samples were small. So I, I think I'm still optimistic on it. I think it's hard to judge it based on the literature so far because a lot of early attempts, people were learning to use the tool itself. So if the tool itself isn't working, it's very hard to say it does or doesn't work for this. So I do think the digital phenotypes make a difference, but you have to share the data back with people too, right? If you're just collecting the data, you're trying to make people aware of their own patterns, not to just to flash up a warning that says danger. Yeah. So I, I think it, it has potential, but it's, it's underdeveloped, even though sometimes people think it's fully developed for it. So, so a good question. Uh, another question here, it says, I love the conceptualization of research in terms of product development. So people are not cringingly, they, they like the word product development. Would you see MQ as also helping to make the bridge to commercially successful products as a powerful way to drive impact, kind of like an incubator or venture capital for the digital mental health space? Yeah, I mean that's that's a hugely exciting um, way to think about it, and something we'd be we'd be really interested in looking at further. So, um, in terms of the funding for this fellowship, uh, it, it wouldn't be restricted to um, you know testing or trialing something from from scratch. If there was something that was looking at that bridging point as to how it moves into uh, spin out or preparation for seed fund or preparation for um, series A or something like that, we'd be really interested as to how the fund could be used in that way. Um, I think in the in the application process, it'd be really essential to understand the environment that you're currently in. So does your university have the, the capability to support a spin-out? Are you trying to do this solo? Like what, what does all look like and how does that come together? Um, but our funding is yeah, really open and flexible and, and we'd be really interested in what that would look like or how complementary funding from a VC or or private equity could could augment. That makes sense. And this question looks like it's more for me. It says, are any specific themes set out by JMIR regarding the use of digital technology and mental health improvement? And a quick answer is there's a 2023 paper, of course, in JMIR Mental Health that I authored and Gunther Eisenbach, the publisher of JMIR, we authored, and it also has someone of lived experience authoring it, Karis Myrick. And we basically put out some of the big challenges in research in the field, some of them being lived experience, use actually incorporating it, some of it being engagement we talked about. One of the biggest challenges in the digital therapeutic space is a lot of these apps will say they have a very good result, but then they don't actually work in the real world. So that engagement and actually real world uptake. And on the digital signal phenotyping side, we said we really need to see replication in different settings. Technology will always, you can always cluster and find three or four clusters. You can always find a p-value of enough data. The real question is, can Lee run it at a place in London and then I run it at a place in Boston? And we go, wow, it worked across different regions and areas. So I think that's kind of the things that we're looking for in JMR Mental Health. There are journals like JMR Formative Research that I send my own research to. There are different places for different stages of research. This is a fun question. I'm going to give it to Lee. It says, how can we protect people from evil by design, evil by design apps, such as, again, we won't name, won't name the name, but ones that seem to have large uptake ethically, but again, seem to be putting out lower quality science and kind of just hooking people onto it. So how do we protect people from the darker side of the stuff? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not. I sympathise massively with this question. I'm not sure I have an easy or simple solution. I think there's a few ways out there, but I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I think. I think as funders, uh, so I'm part of the International Alliance of Mental Health Research Funders, and we met in DC um, together back in November, and this was on our agenda. And and recognising that there is, you know, as well as an elephant graveyard of digital products that have never made it out there, there is a dearth of. Uh, lack of evidence-based uh, products that are being put out to the marketplace. And we were quickly trying to recognize that they need to try and show that they've done some sort of trials on the way through. But there's a lot of angel investment, VC money, private equity money being poured into these. Now, I think for some of it, 
the ecosystem will will correct itself. I think there's a lot of people that are going to lose a lot of money uh, and aren't going to make their Series B or Series C goals because the uptake just isn't there because the product just isn't good enough. And or at some point, regulators will be able to catch up and say, this should have been registered as a medical device and it hasn't been, therefore it's getting chopped off. So I think partly the, the regulatory environment needs to um, police that. I think the financial markets will hopefully calibrate back out. But I, but I think it is for us who are starting from a strong evidence base to really push and be strong on the fact that the rigor is required and that we are talking about people's lives and that that has to be treated with with sanctity and respect and, and how we do that. And our products or, or our research is co-produced with people lived experience. I think if we keep on standing on that platform, then we shine a light on those that aren't doing that. Yeah. In a US example, at least, there's a large lawsuit against Meta, which is the parent company of Facebook in the US now, where different US states have banded together and against an active lawsuit. We don't know the outcome, but they're saying Meta slash Facebook employed strategies that were manipulative of young people and hurt their mental health. So it's the first time where we've seen all these different states band together and go go after a company like this. And again, we don't know what the outcomes will be, but actually the, the court documents were unsealed. You can find them on the internet. So you can actually read kind of what was the legal case that was made against them and what are the damages being sought. Again, ongoing legal case, we don't have any insider special information. But I do think, as you're saying, leaders, there's recognition that there can be good, as we talked about, and that's what hopefully you're trying to fund. That's what we're hopefully trying to publish. That's where society is hopefully trying to inspire. But like everything, it's it's not always good. And that's why great work has to shine through to kind of lead by example. We have time for one more question. We have so many more. So I'm going to try to paraphrase. Oh, my. I'm trying to think. This is interesting. What about the development of digital clinical validation centers? Any insights related to stakeholder mobilization or benchmarking around this? So maybe we just need a new type of validation center where people bring the stuff to and we get unbiased assessments. Yeah, that 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 would be uh, that would be interesting. How you set that up and who who oversees that and how that's run sounds like a great challenge to to sit down and solve over over a glass of wine. <laughs> And okay, I'm going to sneak one more in because this one, is, it says, Lee, are you happy enough? So the key is happy enough, but with the protections of the AI Digital Service Act for emotional well-being. So I think this is a UK act, if I have the background, but I think the idea is there are some new policies around AI digital services, which is a very serious issue, so I shouldn't. But what do you think of, of that kind of early legislative move? Good enough, yeah. Or not. Yeah, I, I, I think it's um, the the green the green flag or the the green tick box is that there is movement and something is beginning to happen. Um, the devil's in the detail yet again, and the the speed at which that regulation is going to have to try and keep up with the changing environment that it's regulating is probably is probably going to be its pitfall. So so even if we go back to uh, data protection acts in the UK, they date back to 1998. And, and the world has changed fairly considerably then in terms of that, and, yes. and they can keep pace. And if we look at the Mental Health Act in the UK, which is around uh, when people have to be admitted to inpatient wards through sectioning, uh, that that still hasn't been reformed and it's been on the slate for five years. And, and it still uses words like imbecile and idiot to describe patients. And, and so, and, and and this is what we're talking about. This is the fundamental basics of mental health care. Can can our legislation keep pace with it? I'm not sure we've got the framework for that. So yes, green flag that's been started, red flag is how on earth and who who's the expertise that's going to try and keep pace with that on the way through. So more more has to be done for sure. Sounds like the expertise could be fellows that you fund, people in our society, people publishing papers. So I think it's the right group of people all here. So I want to Thank you all for joining and contributing. I know we couldn't get to all of the questions, but especially thank you to Lee for one, really taking an MQ in such an exciting, impactful direction. 
of kind of keeping on the cutting edge of where digital is going among all of your other effort in bringing in the lived experience voice in a truly meaningful way. So we'll sign off for here. We'll have more webinars. We'll have more announcements and events. And we'll hopefully send out a link to everyone for the MQ webinar to learn more about all of that when it's when we have it. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to Lee. Thank you to JMIR and team. Bye. Thank you, John. Thanks all. Appreciate it. Thank you.